So here we are. New week, two new randomly generated characters. Let's begin. If you all are doing this um, alongside us at home, or I don't know, you could just be listening or, uh, you know, as a podcast or whatever, um, then... Uh, Where? Okay, here we go. Then we'll uh, we'll just start. We're going to begin by determining if we have a, a female character, male character, or a multi-class character with a percentile role. Fifteen. We have a female character who is a nine, a tiefling. Ooh, we have not had a tiefling in a little while. Actually, I, I don't think we had a tiefling since our uh, our last character for the, the for the beach episode before I took my summer break. And, um, and she was a chaotic evil death cleric. <laughs> we'll see what happens with uh, with this one, right? Female tiefling. Who favors... We're going to roll odds and evens. This isn't technically in the PHB, but we'll... This is kind of a tiebreaker. It's a fun little sub, uh, sub race. There are official sub races now in Splatbook, but because we're sticking to the PHB, let's work in those boundaries. Because you can always expand, but I, I want to show you the, the, the concepts first. Odd. Uh, she favors her human, her human ancestry. And maybe if you're trying to develop her physically, she looks more human. You know, maybe she actually has pupils. Maybe her tail is shorter. Uh, maybe she has normal knees and ankles. Uh, maybe instead of, you know, resty, uh, resty, rusty red, uh, skin, uh, she has, uh, she has more tan, brown, or, I don't know, peach, whatever, whatever you want to flavor this. Uh, you know, she has, she has the, the skin tones that we know associate more to humans than the exotic, uh, purples and reds and whatnot, uh, that tieflings get. Uh, maybe her horns are a little shorter, and don't just uh, and, and don't just assign this to a uh, genetic layer. She may look fully tiefling, but because she was raised in a mixed family, she might just culturally identify more with humans than with tieflings. So it's fun. It's an extra layer. It's a tiebreaker if you really find yourself riding the fence on an aspect of the character. Uh, moving on, let's determine her alignment. With a percentile roll. 62 and 42 is going to place us in neutral, neutral. So she is true neutral, or you could just put N for neutral. TN or N, or I guess NN if you want to be neutral, neutral. So, you know, she could take it or leave it. Now, we're going to come down here and determine with one percentile roll uh, at which level we will generate her. Uh, 64 means we are generating a level 15 character. That means uh, we are going to get four stat bumps. I'm sorry, three. One at level four, one at level eight, and one at level 12. We're so close to the one at level 16. In or to replace a stat bump or an ability score increment, if your DM allows it, you can take a feat. I am going to roll a percentile die to figure out if any of her stat bumps are going to be replaced by feats. With an 80, we look over here. Uh, yes, one feat, uh, one feat is going to be replaced. So we're going to come down here. And of her three, she is going to get one feet of some kind. So for any of you who are riding along, maybe you already are familiar with the feats, uh, you can preload some in mind as we're building the character. And you can offer it as a suggestion. If you're new to D&D &D and you, you say, well, I, I thought feats are what people walk on, that's perfectly fine. And we will still go into that section of the PHB and explore it a little bit. Uh, so hang on, but also remember, this is a participatory stream. This is not my character we're generating. This is our character. This is uh, this is someone that we're generating in our world 
for us as an exercise. And you know what? This this stuff gets uploaded not just to YouTube after a while. This gets uploaded onto our Discord uh, once the content is, is finished for the week. So that if you really like this character, you can download her PDF and play around with her as much as you want. Now, a 13-sided die. We're going to generate right here and determine her background. One, she is an acolyte background. There's nothing really special, I mean, save for the, the deity itself. Uh, save for the deity itself. Uh, so it's not like, well, you know, a charlatan has a favored con, um, or a folk hero is known for something in particular. Well... You know, this is, but it's it's a particular religion. So we're going to roll our 2d8 for personality traits. Three and two. What do those mean? It doesn't matter right now. Just, just bear with it. Two, one, and six for ideal bond and flaw. All we want are placeholders. We'll still build the character once we get this, a little bit of the rigmarole out of the way first. You know, let, let's get our outline. Let's get our silhouette, and then we'll paint uh, the character inside this uh, inside this uh, boundary that we've established. Now we come up to determine her class. We have a big golden D12 just waiting to be pressed. And I'm sure that uh, people out there like Bubonic One are absolutely salivating that we roll a College of Lore Bard. I mean, you're just absolutely... At home, oh, please. We need a party of three bards. <laughs> so why don't we hit this uh, golden D12 and find out what we're getting, huh? <laughs> Bubonic one gags. Here we are. Ready? Five. Five is a fighter. Mola Mola XD. Well, not a bard, but we did get a nice bread and butter D and D fighter. Now coming over here, fighters. Um, oh, I'm gonna have to correct this. Uh, there are uh, there are three different archetypes of fighter. Champions, battle masters, and Eldritch knights. Yeah, uh, you used to be uh, Mola Molkua, um, but Mola Mola XD uh, works just as well. Unless Mola Molkua is out there, in that case, Mola Mola, who are you? All right. <laughs> well, one day. I mean, look, one day it'll happen, Dark Wolf. One day. Uh, so they're going to get one of three archetypes, and they have access to six different types of fighting styles. Let's determine the archetype first, and then we will determine which of the six fighting styles our fighter will have. Let's uh, three-sided die. Roll it. One. This is going to be a champion fighter. And we're going to roll 1d6 to figure out uh, which fighting style. Actually, I think they eventually get a second one. We'll roll that when we get to it, though. But for sure, also one, archery. Very interesting. Fighting style, archery. I think it'd be fun to draw, too. I don't share your same skills, but... I think you'd have a lot of fun with it. Okay, let's come down here. So she is a tiefling. We're going to find them here. They start at 4 feet 9 inches tall. And we are going to add 2d8 inches to her height. All right, we're adding 11 inches. Uh, so she is 4 feet 20 inches tall. There we go. I, that's what I said, right? 5 foot 8. 
Now we're going to take the same 11 and we are going to multiply it by 2d4 pounds, 6. So we're adding 66 pounds to her base weight of 110. And so she is 176 pounds, standing at 5 feet, 8 inches tall. And I'll let you decide if that includes the very tip tops of her horns or if that's just to the top of her noggin. And I, I guess we're not even counting the tail in, uh, in height either. Our last placeholder... Uh, yes, that's true, Bubonic One. She's actually going to get a couple more ability score increases because of being a fighter, and we will cross that bridge when we get to it. Uh, we're going to roll a percentile and find out where in the life cycle this character is. Ready? 71. Uh, she is middle-aged. So we come over here to column 4. I'll scroll up a little bit to, so you all can hopefully see it easier. In column four, tieflings, middle-aged tieflings are between 46 and 60. So we are going to roll a 15-sided die and figure out how old she is. One. All right, so she is middle-aged 46. Everyone threw her a uh, an over-the-hill birthday party and uh, she just had the birthday party and all the hats and everything. Um, and now she gets to have a fun little uh, tiefling midlife crisis or something along those lines. <laughs> all right. Our placeholders are here. That means that uh, we will not need... Uh, we will not need the uh, the random roll generator anymore. So we are going to come over to Chapter 4 in the Player's Handbook. Scrolling down alphabetically, Acolyte's going to be the first background. And here we are. We do Acolyte information first because this represents who she was and what she was doing really before she became an adventurer. This was more than a hobby. It was probably a job, but before fate tapped her for greater things in the course of an adventure or whatever context that you're running your, your campaign in. Let's see. So being an acolyte, you get skill proficiencies in insight and religion. As well, we get two languages of our choice, and tieflings get common, infernal, and now question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. That's right, she's hitting her stride. Um, maybe she's even figured out something cool. If she's an archer, uh, wouldn't that be something if she, like, strung up, uh, you know, if she strung up something between her horns and she used her tail to, like, pluck an arrow and so as she kind of like turned she turns her head and kind of like targets onto someone you know she wouldn't have invented that otherwise you know she needs experience she needs a way to be able to free up her hands for something else right uh so she's turned her uh she's turned her head into a, like a little mini ballista you know she just rigged up a little short bow up there or something <laughs> uh all right uh equipment she's going to be equipped with a holy symbol Um, a prayer book. Incense sticks times five. Vestments, which are the robes you wear when conducting um, your religious order. Probably not what you should be walking around in normally, unless maybe you want to be known as a pilgrim. Um, but your, your nice vestments will get travel worn, but maybe that's part of your charm. Maybe you go village to village to... Uh, you know, to help cure people, to help, uh, you know, salve emotional wounds of downtrodden villagers or something along those lines. Uh, so we have vestments. Uh, you also do get some common clothes. And a belt pouch. Containing 15 gapuz. There we go. We get a background feature called Shelter of the Faithful. It's very useful. Um, 
it is very useful because you can get essentially uh, free healing and room and board as long as you're performing uh, acts of your faith in the community in which you're staying. It's very nice. Uh, greetings from the Plaguelands. Not sure what the D&D version would be called. Well, what's what's the Plaguelands referencing, Delcorin? Also, hello, greetings. It's good to see you again. I know you haven't uh, you haven't really necessarily been around, but uh, it's still nice to have you. Bubonic. For any of you who are newer here, hanging out, uh, Bubonic and Delcorin are, are are some of the founders. Uh, oh, hey, there, there's Bobicus. Bobicus was an early adopter too. Um, you know, so these are the old codgers that are, you know, they're sitting around at the park, uh, playing chess with each other, going, Oh, remember back in the winter of 18? Oh, that young whippersnapper didn't know what he was doing. Oh, it was awkward watching him broadcast content on Twitch. <laughs> what was I talking about? Oh, yes, we wore onions on our belt. That was the style of the time. Back in the winter of 18. Bobacus trapped his players in a dungeon. They had no hope of surviving if they tried to fight their way out. They successfully tricked their way past many, many guards guarding the exit and survived. How were your prisoners able to, to trick their way out of uh, vigilant guards in a, in a dungeon? That is a story itself, Bob, because I'd love to, to know that. The Plague Lands are an area in WoW full of pools of vile stuff, flesh golems, bugs, nasty stuff. Um, so I guess that'd be the Shadowfell, Delcorin. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. Or, I don't know, some layer of hell or something. Alright, now let's, let's discover her personality. Personality trait number three. I see omens in every event and action. The gods try to speak to us. We just need to listen. And personality trait number two. I can find common ground between the fiercest enemies. Empathi oh, empathizing with them and always working toward peace. Well, she is true neutral, right? So, yeah, as we're looking at uh, skills or other things, she seems to be a bit of a negotiator, huh? I'm getting to the bottom, so the fruit punch is really red. Okay. Her ideal is two. Charity. I always try to help those in need, no matter what the personal cost. Her bond is one. I would die to recover an ancient relic of my faith. That was lost long ago. Plot point, plot point. Woo, woo, woo. Not only for you as the player character, bonds. I mean, really, any of the any of this background personality stuff um, is really good for you as a DM. We have a plot point in a campaign by virtue of one of our players just whipping up a character. I would die to recover an ancient relic of my faith that was lost long ago. I mean, that could just be, it could be a side story. It could be backstory. It could be the main MacGuffin of your campaign. Uh, if any of you out there do not know what a MacGuffin is, it is, uh, it's the one ring, right? It's an item that exists to advance the story in, in the most like basic sterile terms. Delcorn, yeah, we're old. We're, we were here before chatbots and, and discord shakes his cane. That's right. Yep, you were here before uh, before chatbots and uh, and Discord. My, how times have changed. You know. Now, uh, now I'm debating getting a second camera. 
you know we're we're, we're it, technology is just continuing to push ever forward <laughs> And her flaw, because we are all flawed creatures, is number six. Once I pick a goal, I become obsessed with it to the detriment of everything else in my life. Woo. So, she could be a bit of a cantankerous woman, huh? No, I might... <laughs> Elsa, don't cross the seal. But Indy, Elsa, just don't cross the seal. Stop. Just literally, do not take two steps back. I'm not even advancing on you. Why are you walking? And you cross the seal. Oh, yeah, shoot. That reminds me, Bobicus. I got to put up... Um, I, I, actually, I used this text box uh, for uh, the session yesterday here. Uh, let's, let's get a friend computer here. We can change this up. Um... Here we go. Now, if any of you have played the game Paranoia, you will realize that this simple statement isn't necessarily as straightforward as it may seem. Uh, Bobacus, uh, they finagled their way in with Charm Person on the one intelligent guard guarding the impenetrable entrance and had him lead them around. Uh, he had them, or he led them deeper into the complex, giving up a ton of information about the place along the way, and eventually they were spotted. An alarm was raised, and the players had to flee. They popped into a corner and cast darkness and rope trick with a ten-foot rope. Well, it's not necessarily Portal, but you're kind of thinking along similar lines. Uh, GLaDOS could very easily uh, could e very easily fit into a game of Paranoia. Okay, that is our background. We are going to now explore what you get by virtue of being a tiefling. Here we are. Intelligence increases by one, and charisma increases by two, so we're going to put some placeholders here. We already have a lay, uh, age alignment size. We are a medium creature. Speed, 30, 15, 15, 0. Dark vision out to 60 feet. Uh, hellish resistance, we have resistance to fire damage. There we go. Um, I'll zoom in a little bit here so you can see on this variant character sheet we use, there are little bubbles you can fill in for immunities, resistances, and vulnerabilities. So we, fi we filled in the middle dot here for fire. Uh, to represent that. As well, you get Infernal Legacy. So we know the Thaumaturgy cantrip. So IL, we know Thaumaturgy. Once you reach third level, you can cast the, cast the Hellish Rebuke spell once per day as a second level spell. And once you reach fifth level, you can also cast a Darkness spell once per day. Uh, so we're going to real quick go down here to our level two spells. IL... To, uh, to determine where we get that. Um, and this is um, Hellish Rebuke once per long rest, or like once per day. Once per long rest. Uh, Charisma. And Darkness is a second level spell. Darkness once per long rest.
and we already have our languages. So there we go. A fighter that knows thaumaturgy. Interesting. Yes, praise friend computer. Uh, GLaDOS says, or uh, Del GLaDOS says, Delcorn says, GLaDOS likes to send humans to places that aren't exactly conducive to continued existence. Yes, exactly. Uh, Bobicus, so now the leader is trying to figure out where they went, but there were no int spellcasters, and they were far from civilization, so I decided they didn't know that rope trick was a possibility. Further, no one in the dungeon could cast detect magic to find the rope trick entrance, so they had an hour of safety, but the leader put the dungeon on alert for 12 hours. Roger is is bonding with our with our uh, tiefling fighter here over some hell, uh, hellacious rebuking. Well, you the the things that you can certainly get away with with extra dimensional spaces that would never fly in my campaign world, Bobicus. I don't allow such pockets in my world. <laughs> Insert snooty laugh here. I'm. It, it's it it is a very I mean, it's called rope trick for a reason, uh, and it it exists for the for the reason that you're reading uh, in Bobicus's narration. Hey, Est Wild, good to see you. Hello, yellow, yellow, yellow. Now let's collapse uh, our racial benefits here and go down to our classes, and ding 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 ding, we have a fighter. We have a level 15 fighter, meaning that we get all of this fun stuff right up here. Oh, Estwild, Estwild, Estwild. If you were in my home if you were in my home campaign, no demi planes for you, my friend. No siree. No bags of holding. No rope tricks. Um, nope, none of that stuff. No, no portable holes. No, no other dimensions. Like there's no plane of fire. There's no uh, Abaddon. Uh, there is none of that stuff. Get out of here. Go on. Go on and get, you varmint. All right, we are a D10 hit die class, and as we're level 15, it just so happens that we have 15 D10 Worth of hit dice. Hi, Nanov. Good to see you. Welcome. Uh, hit dice re uh, represent your intrinsic ability to heal yourself uh, between adventures, combats, whatever. You can get hit points back without uh, other party members or yourself needing to expend spells or potions. Uh, so, Estwild Banishment, we reflavored that it just kind of blinks them. It blinks them out for a minute or so for the duration of the spell. Or uh, how did we reflavor that? Because I did have someone who took banishment, and we had to do we had to do something, and I think they just sort of blinked out of existence for a little bit. But some spells just don't necessarily work. You know, it's just the way it is. When if you at home make those those sort of determinations, realize look. This is your world. You do not have to run every monster, every race, every spell that's available in the player's handbook or monster manual. Just because it's there, you can run a very low or no fantasy D&D game. Now that means you're going to have a lot of thieves, barbarians, fighters, and, and such if you run a low or no fantasy. Um, but just because a spell exists in the player's handbook doesn't mean it's ever available to your players. If you do that, as a DM, make sure you and your players are on the same page and they realize, as a condition of your world, that X, Y, or Z doesn't work, doesn't work in this way, or um, or maybe, it, it, you know, instead of meeting in the middle, it's just a minor tweak of some of some kind. Uh, if everyone's on the same page and everyone agrees and they say, yeah, that's fine, I'm, I'm happy to run in a world like this, then that's... Goblins and orcs might not exist in your world, and that is totally okay. 
Uh, and you, cause, especially because you could so easily reskin goblins and orcs to be, I don't know, something else. <clears throat> S-Wild, yep, no complaints. If everyone in the game to play with the world, yep, it's all good. Thaumaturgy, that can be used in many ways, like, um, uh, to restring her bow. Yeah, well, uh, that'd be a lot of fun, especially on a fighter. Bobicus continues, they cast silent image and ghost sound to call the guards away from the door. And through a combination of expertise, bardic inspiration, and clerical guidance, roll a 30 on the persuasion check, pulling every single one of the guards away. Problem was, unknown to the players, the leader was in the same room they cast the illusion in, and the players are in the same room the guards have just been drawn to. Woo! Woo! <laughs> out of the frying pan and into the fire at least at this point in time in your story uh armor armor all <laughs> and shields oh, they, that's arguably what armor all does weapons simple and martial no tool proficiencies and a good old fashioned strength and con saving throw proficiency Continuing on. Skills. We get to choose two skills from acrobatics, animal handling, athletics, super colliders. Lend me your strength, your energy. Thank you very much uh, for the host, super colliders. Welcome. I hope that you had fun. Uh, I hope that you had fun uh, doing your own broadcast, and thank you for sharing that uh, on our channel. Which, by the way, I will bring up. If um, if any of you do broadcast, or or you know someone, oh, super colliders, I thank you again. Oh. Woo! <laughs> uh, thank you for that. If any of you do. Um, like, cause super, you, you were broad. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. You were broadcasting the other day here, uh, mer mercilessly torching your DM. You please share your content here. If you're broadcasting yourself, or if you have a good friend that's doing something you think we'd enjoy, uh, that's what this place exists for. It does. It does. Uh, but thank you, Super. Bobakiss, the alarm, the alarm gong starts sounding again, and the guards are extremely confused. My players immediately lay down a cloud of darkness on the still confused guards, run toward the doors, cast web behind them, and nail the strength checks to pull on the ropes that make the drawbridge open. The guards fail their rolls and break through the webbing and harry the players, and the players end the session successfully escaping their certain doom. Hey, lurk, lurk as much as you want, Super. I really appreciate your uh, your subscription, your lurking, uh, your sharing, and just being a part of the community. Thank you. That is a heck of a story, Bobicus. So I guess the question is... Are they still out of the fire or out of the frying pan into the fire, or what's what's going to be happening? Sounds like they blew a lot of resources um, in this place to uh, they blew a lot of resources here to be able to uh, to make this escape. What's going to happen? Uh, looking at the skills, well, let's check out her personality, right? Um. I see omens in every action. I can find common ground between the fiercest of enemies. Uh, we already have insight and religion. Um, what else? Charity. I try to help those in need. I would die to recover an ancient relic of my faith that was lost long ago. Once I pick a goal, I become obsessed with it to the detriment of everything else in my life. That kind of sounds... I, I'm kind of getting a history and survival. Oh, well, um, let's see. How should I pronounce that? Uh, Spoy... Spoy Gavin? Something like that? You come in peace. 
Wow. <laughs> Uh-oh, Del Corin's on the S boy. Um, or SP. I, I don't know how you'd like me to uh, to pronounce Spoon. SP or Spoon? Uh, I guess I'll go with Spoon. Uh, that is the Tick's favorite battle cry. Uh, thank you for coming along with Super Colliders. I hope that you uh, you enjoy the ride. Uh, we're going through a random character creation. Um, and uh, after we finish that up, we'll take a little break. And we're going to start on character number two of the week. And you'll be able to come in on the ground floor. That being said, Spoon, you can ask questions at any point during the process. Or if you want to do like what Bobicus is doing and share stories from your tabletop experience... Uh, you can ask questions, share content. This is a very interactive stream. You are sitting at a table in a game store. Welcome, have a seat, and one of us, one of us. Anyone who says they come in peace tends to have a disintegration rate tucked in their pocket. Ack, 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 ack. So maybe, 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 like this. nothing can stop her once she picks a goal. Um, she would die to recover a relic, she, charity. She's a very intense woman. I would almost say intimidation and Imitation and maybe survival. Intimidation, I mean. Oh, Bubonic, you think history? Yeah, I know, Delcorn. It's been a while since I got to talk, uh, talk uh, Martian also. They'll be pursued, of course, but they can easily outrun the Basilisks, which were the majority of the threat the guards posed. Ooh. I splurged and got one of those Wormwood Dice Tower setups. I'm excited. I hope it uh, it goes well for you, Estwild. Uh, if if you can sh take a picture and share it, um, I'd love to see it and uh, let us know how it works for you. Spoon, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah, just uh, off off on the side, right? Uh, let's see. Uh, we get some chainmail or a le uh, leather and a longbow and twenty arrows. Well, she did. She did take the. Uh, oh, spoon. No, run. Follow me if you want to live. Uh. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, spoon, for that. She did take an archery style, so it would show that she's perhaps a more dexterous build. And and don't make the mistake that all fighters just have to be the meat and sarcasm person of the party. Um, they can be dexterous. In fact, a fighter in fifth edition can even put um you know can put a, a an archer fighter can in many ways put an arching ranger to shame. And you're like, but that's silly. Like rangers are the are the are the, the stereotypical archers. And they do their own thing, that's for certain. But uh, fighters can be very good with a bow as well. She decided to be a huntress, but doesn't have the wisdom required to be a ranger. Y yes, uh, th there's a good scenario, bubonic one. So maybe in this case, we do build a fighter who takes leather and a longbow that has a quiver with 20 arrows. If I missed it initially as I was on my as on my soapbox, I'm sorry. Uh-oh, Delcorn, are you getting sassy? You're going to go on an adventure? Yes, a random dungeon, which by the way, Spoon, if you look down below, you can see that uh, that you can go on adventures in this chat, and there's a lot of fun role-playing uh, bot interaction that you can have, as well as other as communi um, role-play connectivity with other community members, too. Uh, so, uh, you roll normally to avoid the falling rock. Lands on a 17. Del Corin successfully avoids the rock, 
and wins 350 experience points. Uh, uh, Miss Awu, uh, Miss Darkwolf, can you award the experience points to Delcorin? A por favor. Archery, you gain a plus two bonus to attack rolls you make with ranged weapons. Uh, so we're going to just, we're seeding this that she's already going to get a plus two on, on top of this. Now what this can also mean, by the way, if you didn't want to make her a super duper expert marksman, super dexterous, you could still give her the chain mail, right? And you could have dex be a lower stat, but by getting that plus two to hit, she can still maintain accuracy while being a bruiser and having a strong arm. So I bring that up for your all's consideration. Delcorin runs out of the dungeon with a 3D printed idol. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Martial weapon and a shield or two martial weapons. Well, she'll probably take some kind of a martial weapon and a shield just so she can have a backup of some kind. <laughs> mm, pardon me. Mm, reverse hiccup or something. Which kind of martial weapon do you see her using? Sword and board? Axe? Hammer? Flail? Do we give her a big two-handed weapon like a maul? Or a halberd? Or a lance? Huh? Uh-huh. <laughs> All right, let's let's take a look here. She's an acolyte of some sort of a faith. I see omens in every event in action. Uh, I find common ground between the fiercest enemies. Uh, she tries to help those in need. I would die to recover an ancient relic of my faith that was lost long ago. And once I pick a goal, I become obsessed with it to the detriment of everything else in my life. Beck de Corbin. I'm not sure I get you, Roger. A light crossbow and 20 bolts or two hand axes. Hmm, she's getting all the weapons. A Dungeoneer's pack or an Explorer's pack? If she's going to try and recover a lost relic, we're probably going to go for a Dungeoneer's pack. A polearm. So, is that more... Um, here, we can go to chapter 5 real quick. And we can reskin things, and, you know, if we find a stat line that we think works with the weapon type, that's that's fine, too. So, if you're thinking that she's a, a polearm fighter of some kind, we come down here, and we have pikes. Uh, we have... Da -da -da -da, what else? Halberds, which are kind of like um, axes on a stick. Pikes are pointy bits on sticks if they don't already have pointy bits. Um, glaives. That's also slashing. Halberd or glaive is probably fine. It's interesting that they're both effectively the same, right? Glaive, 20 gold, 1d10 slashing, 6 pounds, heavy reach, two-handed. And we come down to a halberd, 20 gold, 1d10 slashing, 6 pounds, heavy reach, two-handed. So I guess it's kind of six to one half, half dozen to the other, huh? AD&D had a dozen pole arms. Yeah. It's kind of weird that they had a redundancy like that. I've not played a pole arm character, so um, this is... I'm, I'm kind of discovering this alongside you all, that they actually have kind of a... I thought glaives were like fancy throwing stars. Glaive, guise arm, uh, glaive, guise arm, military fork, lucerne hammer, etc. 
Well, if it's all the same, then I guess we'll give her a longbow and we'll give her a glaive. Uh, as per your all's suggestion, let's come back over here to fighter. And uh, she's going to get a light crossbow and 20 bolts or two hand axes. Uh, why don't we give her the light crossbow? Cover with 20 bolts. There we go. And she has her pack. Uh, so now uh, we have our fighting style, which uh, we have, we've gotten. We also are going to get our second wind, so we get a little bit of HP recovery in combat. At second level, we're going to get... Because remember, we're making a 15th level character. Action surge, so we can act again. We are going to get our martial archetype at third, and we'll get to what, what that is going to confer in a little bit. Uh, ASIs. Now, fighters get ability score increase or improvements or stat bumps more often than other characters. They get them at 4th, 6th, 12th, 8th, 12th, 14th, 16th, 19th. Uh, they get two more than other classes. This means, so instead of the three that she'd get by being level 15... Uh, she's going to get 4, 6, 8, 12, 14. And one of those is going to be a feat. As, uh, as we, are, uh, we are enabling feats for our characters in our workshop here. Um, so that is going to be... Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. So three stat bumps and a feat. I'm going to make a note here because we're... We'll come to that kind of last-ish, okay? We're also going to get extra attack. And indomitable. You can re-roll a saving throw that you fail. If you do, you must use the new roll. That's what we get by virtue of just being a fighter. Now we're going to look at the archetypes, and we randomly rolled champion for this character. Uh, Bubonic says, a Becta Corbin combines a pick or hammer with a big pointy end. Basically, it's a big pickaxe with a war hammer. Interesting. Trey and Terrasante. I like learning this stuff. I really do. Okay, by being a champion, we have improved critical. We score crits on a 19 or 20. We also get what's called Remarkable Strength. Starting at 7th level, you can add half your proficiency bonus rounded up to any strength, dex, or constitution check you make that doesn't already use your proficiency bonus. Now... Do not forget, initiative is a dexterity check. Therefore, remarkable strength, just as with Jack of All Trades, speaking of bards from prior in the character creation process, uh, you can add this to your initiative because it is a dexterity check. It's used especially for breaking knights in plate armor from beyond their sword range. Oh, is it, is, so it's a weapon. Do they set it in the ground? Kind of a... Th oh, no, that, that's braced against uh, cavalry. Uh, or cavalry for uh, charges and whatnot. In addition, when you make a running long jump, the distance you can cover increases by a number of feet equal to your strength modifier. Additional fighting style. Okay, so we are going to get another fighting style. And we are also going to get... Uh, improved goes to superior critical, and we now have a 15% chance to land a critical hit. Uh, we're not high enough level to get the survivor trait. Uh, so what we will do is come back here. Fighters have these fighting styles, right? Archery, defense, etc. I'm going to roll a d6, re-rolling a 1, to find out what her other type of 
uh, her other type of fighting style is. Three, dueling. There we go. Archery and dueling. So she's versatile. She can uh, she can try and pick at you from far away, and if you get in close. Then, um, you know, she gets some kind of a finesse weapon, or if we do make her strong, she can wield a longsword or something else, too. And, uh, and she can tag you in close combat, too. She's a very, uh, a very flexible, literally and metaphorically, uh, a very flexible fighter. She's especially, okay, that was for breaking knights. No, knights on ground were almost as bad because of the heavy armor they wore. Hammer and picks are great ways of punching. Yeah, hammers, hammers put in a lot of work then, huh? They did, they did. All right, so congratulations. Um, we have uh, we have uh, built the fundamentals of our character. We have a chassis for her, right? We know her personality, so her character, her character's character, um, and we filled in a lot of the things that she can do. Now, now that we have the chassis, let's drop the engine in her by virtue of scores. Of, uh, of, of stat scores. Because look, they help your character, but your ability scores are not your character. I mean, ju just describing your character as strong certainly can work, but you can do so much more with the description of your character than saying she has an 18 in strength or dex. We use the standard array of 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, 8 in order to uh, disperse ability scores uh, throughout um, to uh, disperse her ability scores throughout her uh, well, her personage if she is this tough adventurer she wants like she's willing to die to recover she picks a goal she's dedicated um, I would uh, who do, 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 I don't know I would say constitution should be a big one for her as well um, I mean, I almost want to put 15 in Constitution just to get her a little bit closer uh, to getting a nice fat plus 3. Um, so if bear with me. Now, any of you out there can throw out your own version of what you think the spread of her score should be. Please feel free to do so and just kind of give a blurb on, on why that is. Uh, or if you want to nitpick at, at mine, you're welcome to do so as well. I don't take personal offense to that. But if we take a look, let's say we go 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, and 8. This would make her a very, like, a well-rounded character, right? She doesn't have an exceptional weakness. Her charisma is standard. Her charisma would be a 10 in this uh, in this case. If you really wanted, and you say, no, 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 her intimidation or her charisma should be higher, well, you know, she was an acolyte, maybe she never really got past that low level of service, and you could swap the 10 for the 8 here, if you like that more. Bubonic One says, if you don't ring their clocks by smacking them in the head, then the Warhammer puts dents in that massive armor, weakening it for later hits. Where the pick was specifically used to punch holes in heavy solid armor. Just goes to show you that the civilian tools turned into military weapons are oftentimes the most effective and overlooked. Yeah, you don't need some, you know, well, I mean, in IRL. Uh, I mean, in D&D, we have fancy magical stuff, but um, yeah. Uh, if we do this, you know, so she'd have a, a slight weakness. You know, she's not the smartest person. But so th this would be up to you. Do you think she's well-rounded, right? Um, if she can find common ground, maybe that would be investigation as well. Maybe her intelligence should be higher, which is why I, I thought originally to put her intelligence at at least a neutral uh, zero. She sees omens and things. Uh, she tries to help those in, uh, in need. Uh, she picks a goal and becomes obsessed. Fighting with a scythe is probably always going to be a bad idea. Yeah, it does sound very romantic in a way, doesn't it, Roger? I mean, just going in there, you're like, yeah, this is so cool. 
Uh, but in practicality, maybe not so much. <laughs> so if we stick with this, and again, you are welcome to um, you're welcome to change the outlay if you like. Um, let, if we add our racial modifiers, our charisma is going to go to ten, our intelligence to eleven, and uh, and so this is what we're starting at at level one. Uh, bear in mind that we are going to get to take a feat. Uh, and some of those can actually give you a stat bump. So let's do that first before we assign our three other ASIs in order to round up her scores. Chapter 6, Customization Options. We come over here. Um, let's see. Uh, we could go pull our master if we're if we want to give her a glaive. Uh, when you take the attack action and attack with only a glaive, halberd, or quarterstaff, you can use a bonus action to make a melee attack with the opposite end of the weapon. The weapon's damage die for this attack is a d4, and the attack deals bludgeoning damage. While you're wielding a glaive, halberd, pike, or quarterstaff, other creatures provoke opportunity attacks from you when they enter your reach. Oh. That could be interesting. Roger, you think that she has a horrible scar, which is reflecting her charisma? You know, some people do that, where they, they you know, physical beauty uh, is a part of charisma. Uh, others are like, no, 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 it's how you present yourself, and you can also pineapple pen the two together and say, yeah, it's, it's physical beauty, um, but it's also how socially fluid are you, or how do you present yourself or things along those lines. Um, you know, we could, look, she's a fighter. She probably does have some, some scars on her, Roger. Pike was developed late in the night era before the introduction of such weapons by the Scots. It was darn near impossible for simple spears to punch through a knight's armor. Oh, and you said also a pit can ruin a knight's plate armor day faster than smacking him with a sword over and over. Yeah, because you're punching into it. And the Romans and their hedgehog formations. If there's another feat that you'd like to give her, uh, for sure, like Sharpshooter, you've mastered ranged weapons and can make shots others find impossible, you gain the following benefits. Attack at long range doesn't impose disadvantage. That can be very huge. Your ranged weapon attacks ignore half cover and three quarters, also huge. And before you make an attack with a ranged weapon that you're proficient with, you can choose to take a minus five penalty to the attack roll. If the attack hits, you add plus 10 to the attack's damage. That could be big as well. So then it would come down to if we're let's say that we're juggling these two as weapon feats, do we see her more as a as a sharpshooter or uh, or is she good with the longbow enough already that we need to supplement her melee skills with the glaive? Yeah, sharpshooter is great, bubonic. If you want to go with that, we can we can give her uh, sharpshooter. Now there's no um, there's no ability bonus to that, but that's fine because sharpshooter gives her a lot of options to undergo or to undertake. That said, now we get to add um, three ASIs or ability score improvements. That's adding two points to one ability, or one point to two abilities. If we do that. I think for sure we can split our first one to round up our con and our strength, right? Then we can use another, and we can say, well, do we want to keep strength and dex the same? Or if we really want to make her more of a sharpshooter, maybe we go 16 here. 
And now we have one more. We have one more stat bump. If this was your character, conceptualize where would you put these uh, these these stat bumps. You could very well be doing it differently than I am on screen. And even if you don't voice it in chat, think about it. What kind of a character is she to you? Is she well-rounded? Do you want her to specialize in something more than the other? And consider this too. Look, our intelligence is sitting at 11. And that might be making some of you itch out there like, 11? Oh, I want that nice round number to get my modifier up. But if I do that, what am I going to do? Because I'm, I'm going to have to have an odd number in something else. Bear this in mind. Your strength score and your constitution score provide mechanical benefits in the game. So having an odd constitution or strength score is fine because while you're not getting a um, an increased modifier in that stat, you are still going to be able to receive a... Uh, a mechanical benefit from that. With constitution, it comes into things like holding your breath and not drowning. And with your strength score, uh, that comes into play for things like uh, jumping distances, which, by the way, you have remarkable strength uh, for jumping distances as well as how much you can haul, right? What's your carrying capacity? Things like that. In ancient Roman warfare, says Bubonic, the testudo or tortoise formation was a type of shield wall commonly used by the Roman legions during battles, particularly sieges. Testudo is the Latin word for tortoise. The Greek term for this formation is shalon. And during the Byzantine era, it seems to have evolved uh, to what military manuals of the era call the fulcrum. Uh, Romans were very, very methodical in their battle formations. Their shields were perfect. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. So with our last one, why don't we give her a bump up in intelligence and we'll throw the spare in strength. Hopefully that makes sense and maybe, I don't know, did that reveal something that you didn't know? Or does that help encourage you that if you ever are faced with this, you know, with this itch, you're like, oh, I have a spare ability point to throw into something. What do I do? Put it in strength or con and, and use it. Use it. Okay, now that we have this, uh, let's see, our strength modifier is two, dex is three, con is three, int is one, whiz is one, charisma is zero. Now that the engine is dropped in the uh, in the the chassis of the vehicle, vroom vroom, let's hit that gas and send power and fuel and everything through it, and uh, and have this filter out um, to uh, to scores and such. Saving throw. Whoops, actually, I forgot to put that over here in classes. Let's go to fighter. At fifteenth level, we are we have a plus five to our proficiency bonus go and actually we have extra attack times two I forgot that okay indomitable we also have times two there we go uh, our saving throw because we're proficient is two plus five so that's seven athletics would normally be a two right because that is our strength modifier however remarkable strength gives us half half our proficiency rounded up for checks in which we are not proficient we are not proficient in athletics therefore our athletics is actually going to go to a five i hope that makes sense dexterity is going to be three for the save because you don't get that for the save you get it for checks saves and checks are different Acrobatics, we're going to encounter the same thing. Three plus three from our uh, from our remarkable strength is going to give us six acrobatics, six sleight of hand, and six stealth. How about that for a fighter, huh? 
especially one that can uh, poke you from a distance or uh, or may turn you into a pin cushion with a longbow or a light crossbow. Now there's no skill checks directly associated with constitution. Um, I mean, we'll get an eight for a saving throw. However, I don't know, your your DM might call for certain circumstances, like a, some kind of a, uh, a survival or an in endurance used to be a skill of its own in D&D. &D. You, you might have a DM that would call for an endurance check based on con. And if you did that, you would get to roll at a plus six. Bubana continues, Roman legionnaires wore light metal armor and spears with massive shields. They learned very well from the Spartan tactics. If you could punch through their shield and weigh it down, they were way weakened. Yes. And I appreciate you sharing uh, that that history and, uh, you know, in this lesson, this side lesson itself, Bubonic one. Um, I mean, you, you're all, uh, the chat that, that, that goes on in this channel is amazing, and I'm so fortunate um, to have all of you who are passionate about this and offer these alternative names and concepts, uh, IRL or in fantasy, um, you are all amazing. Thank you very much. Uh, initiative is a dexterity check, and therefore our initiative is plus six. Again, how's that for a fighter, huh? Especially an arching duelist. And our armor class, well, leather gives us uh, 11 plus dex, so our armor class is 14, but with a shield, if we're using it, because you, uh, you know, really for any of her weapons, they won't allow the use of a shield. If you want, you can go like 14 slash 16, or, you know, if you go 16 and you have this little uh, shield down here uh, marked, then you know that that two is coming from a shield. However you want to do it, as long as you're aware, you have your, your, your armor AC, and then a shield adds a static plus two. Passive perception. Oh, we haven't gotten that far. Anyway, intelligence, all this is one <laughs> going down the line, except religion, which is six. Saving wisdom, dun, 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 all, these, all these are also one. However, we do have a six insight and a six survival. And then Charisma is zero going down the line, except for Intimidation, uh, which is going to be a five. Because uh, if you get in her way, she's going to say grr. Or if she's negotiating with someone, and, and they're like, no, 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 we have to have it our way. She's going to, you know, hit the table and, and look at you and say, no, be reasonable here. Romonger, I am excellent. I am muy excellente this evening. Um, I had a very wonderful, a, a super secret voice chat. Ooh la la. Um, it, Bubonic One is going over uh, history and going over, you know, Roman tactics and whatnot. As we're we're talking about a fighter that is, you know, uses pole arms and arrows, and you know, isn't your stereotypical sword and board heavy armor uh, fighter. I mean, if you look at her, look, plus six initiative, six acrobatics, five athletics, and she's not proficient in either of those. Um, we have a very interesting female tiefling uh, champion fighter with an acolyte background. Um, she's a negotiator. She pursues. She's a very cool character. Uh, we even, we even. Um, I, well, I, I mean, I'll say we because it, it's the it's a collective here. Uh, but I even thought it'd be fun if she kind of like strung up something between her horns, and she used her tail uh, to kind of pluck, right? She used her tail to like to pluck and throw like a bolt or an arrow or something from uh, from between them. So she, her head was like a turret anywhere she looked. Oh, it didn't work out, Bubonic. I, if if you hit something you love, oh, I because some people like history. Well, history, I gotta memorize dates. And meanwhile, if you have that passion and you're making the battles come alive and the characters are compelling, oh, it's great. Yes, swords historically were sidearms. Passive perception's 11 because it's 10 plus your perception modifier and that represents your natural awareness. Our scores, uh, let's figure out her hit points, right? At first level, you get the maximum number of hit points for your, your class based on your hit die. So she gets 10. 
Now for the other 14 levels, remember she's 15th level, but we already have her first level hit points. So for all of her 14 other levels, we're going to go 14 times half her hit die plus one, so a six. Does that make sense? With level advancement beyond one, you get half plus one your hit die, unless your DM says otherwise and makes you roll it or something else. But wait, there's more. For every level, all 15, you get bonus hit points based on your constitution modifier. Therefore, bada boom, hey. Look at that. That is an extra 45 hit points from having a plus three con mod on this character. Uh, we have 84 up here. So we have 94. Uh, we have... 139. 139 hit points on this uh, on this fighter. Sten attached a lamp to one of her horns. Oh, that, yeah. Like a little bullseye lamp. So, you know, as she looked around, uh, it, would, it was kind of like a, a hands-free flashlight kind of a thing. I like that, Romonger. I like that. And you know what? What's the worst that happened? You know, someone hit the fuel and a little bit of fire leaked onto her? <laughs> now, our longbows have this plus two because of our, our uh, because of our archery fighting style. Don't forget that you are proficient, so there's we're already at a seven. We get our proficiency bonus, and our, we get to add in our dex mod as well. So with a longbow and the light crossbow, she's shooting a plus ten. At a glaive, it's still not bad. She is swinging her glaive at a plus seven. Now, bear in mind that the archery fighting style only adds that bonus to hit, not to damage. Therefore, if we come over here and we look at our Chapter 5 equipment... A longbow is 1d8 piercing. 1d8 plus 3 piercing. It's not going to be plus five. We're just more accurate. It doesn't mean we deal more damage directly. You could argue that over the course of the combat, because you are more accurate, you'll deal more damage. And yes, that's technically true, etc. so forth. But on the single attack, you do not deal more damage. Uh, light crossbows are the same. 1d8 plus three piercing. And glaives are 1d10 this is a strength-based weapon, so plus two slashing damage. And there we go. There's our Thaumaturgy cantrip, and of course, uh, she is going to get... Um, oh, she earns a name, by the way. Uh, she is going to get uh, her Infernal Legacy spells down here that we have already written in. But you know what? Ladies and gents... Um, aside from any artistic touches, if you wanted to conceptualize her that way, we have a finished character. We have our first character of our five that we're going to produce this week. We're going to make five characters, a map, and an adventure to, uh, to take you all on um, conceptually on Saturday. With Sharpshooter, she can do uh, 1d8 plus 13 with a plus 5 to hit. Wait, what? Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the yeah, uh, I'm, I the sharpshooter feat allows you to take a minus five. So if you're willing to shoot at only a plus five, then you get a plus ten to damage if you hit. So yes, if you attack at a plus five, you'll get one d eight plus thirteen. Exactamundo, bubonic. Thank you for bringing that up. As you know, she took the feat for a reason. Yep, yep, yep. All right, everyone, we're gonna take a uh, we're gonna take a, a short break here, about ten minutes. Get up, stretch, uh, you know, get your thinky bits all in order again. Uh, get something to eat. I don't know. Go say hi to your pet or significant other, or um, I don't know. Listen to a song, have some fun. We'll be back in about ten minutes to uh, create our character. And in the meantime, by the way. If you have name suggestions 
for our female tiefling champion fighter, uh, who is a duel, uh, an archer and a duelist, and can also uh, use, uh, you know, I mean, she's she has a pole arm also to keep people uh, at bay. Please feel free to throw out names, and, and we'll save the we'll save the file under her name, and and she'll be complete. So, all right, everyone, see you back in about ten minutes, okay?